Welcome back to Introduction to Computational Fluid Dynamics. I'm Steve Miller. Today we'll be talking about boundary condition placement and particular examples. Note that there's an extra part to this video that talks about examples for a particular commercial solver. In the previous class, we discussed different formulations, equations, and implementations of the basics of the different fluid dynamic boundary conditions. These are most applicable to the Navier-Stokes equations or Euler equations and related models which are the ones we're primarily talking about in this class. Also remember that these boundary conditions are formulated in the continuum space. In the discrete set of equations, we'd of course would need to implement them as discrete mathematics within the computer. In the particular, we talked about the boundary conditions shown on the left. We'll also be examining almost all of these today in the class, talking about best practices, reviewing their basic functionality, and showing examples for each case, just to solidify uh, where they're at. Today we'll be talking about the typical cases. We'll look at the example boundary conditions. In particular, we'll look at external flows, boundary layers, jets, pipes, quet flows, etc. We'll make notes on the boundary condition placement. Remember, their placement is just as important as their specification. And like I mentioned before, we'll be going through a few examples for a commercial solver in another part of the video. The first case we'll look at is the pipe flow. This represents flow through maybe a pipe or a square duct or any type of simple, um, you know, uh, three-dimensional or two-dimensional geometry, maybe has curves, and it's characterized as an internal flow problem, as we talked about before. It could be compressible or incompressible. It could be turbulent or laminar. These are all choices of the solver and partially the boundary conditions. Here on the right, we have one particular flow. The grid is um, really a unstructured grid, but it has a lot of structure in it, of course. You can see this green mesh represents a surface mesh, and these two blue meshes represent the end caps of this particular tube. So that's those are the surface meshes. There's also an internal volumetric mesh, which is just not shown. In this particular solution, they put a single plane through the middle and put contours on it. So the plane is just a plane of contours. There's also a cross contour plane here. This might be something like pressure or velocity, but they don't specify, so it's better not to guess. It just shows that this is something physical about the solution. We'll talk more about visualization results later in best practices on how to improve this type of plot. Nonetheless, if this is simply a flow through a pipe or a duct, what boundary conditions might we want to put? Well, we could imagine that we would want to have at least an inlet condition of some type. This might be a velocity, mass flow, pressure inlet. We'd also need an outlet, perhaps on this part of the pipe where my cursor is. And we could also have boundary conditions on the wall. That would be this green mesh, and that could be slip conditions or no slip conditions. Remember, that's where the velocity is zero or we're allowing the velocity to slip on the wall. It is completely up to us to choose what kind of inlet and outlet boundary conditions there are. For example, in this case, if it's an incompressible flow, it might make sense to have a constant mass flow rate in and out of the domain. You'll also notice that the exit and inlet of the domains are relatively far away from the pipe, and the flow becomes relatively, or pipe bend, excuse me, and the flow becomes relatively uniform near the exit and inlet. This is because, as you'll see later in best practices, that it's good to try and let the flow develop and become relatively uniform with less disturbances near inlets and outlets. This will reduce the chance of having um, some kind of vorticity or, or inverse flow going uh, through the outlet of the domain, for example. Let's next look at a very famous flow called the taylor coet flow. That's shown on the right. It's basically an annulus where the inner part of the annulus is rotating in one direction and the outer part is rotating in the opposite direction. That is counterwise and clockwise. This could also be a laminar or turbulent flow. In the Solution on the right, you see this particular condition. Here's the inner cylinder, which might be turning in one direction, and the outer cylinder, which could be stationary turning in the other. These types of flows are studied for many reasons. Uh, for one, there's analytical solutions, especially for the laminar flow case. Also, experiments of these flows can be easily constructed in small labs because you simply need a cylinder located in a pipe with some kind of visualization or measurement techniques. Next, it's also easy to perform a computational fluid dynamics because you could use cylindrical coordinates and you could benchmark your solver to see if it matches the experiment and of course analytical solution. There are of course turbulent solutions for this and you could use your CFT solver to match the statistics of turbulence. What boundary conditions might we use? Well, you could perhaps, if you wished, 
especially if it's a steady flow, use a symmetry condition. And you could meet, use one plane of symmetry or two planes of symmetry or even more. You could, if, if you look at this from like an azimuthal angle, you could actually use two planes of symmetry to essentially do one slice of the pie, if you will, and have even smaller and smaller computational domains. You could also, if you wish, have an axisymmetric boundary condition. If you use these two boundary conditions, you might be losing something about the turbulence if you're doing an unsteady turbulent case. For the walls, you might choose for the interior wall or exterior wall if you want it to be moving a so-called slip wall or a moving no-slip wall. A slip wall, of course, might be stationary relative to the fluid in the Eulerian frame and allow the fluid to flow around um, over it. That would not correspond to the experimental case, of course, which would be a no-slip wall. We might also put a no-slip wall at one of the boundaries. If we put a no-slip wall at both boundaries, that is the inner and outer ring, then of course no flow would occur because there's nothing to drive it. There's no pressure gradients, temper gr or gr temperature gradients. And so at the inner wall, perhaps, we might put in a so-called moving no-slip wall or a slip wall with a prescribed velocity. The so moving slip wall would just indicate that we're sending the velocity vectors on the wall to a particular value, which would probably correspond to something as a function of the radius of cylinder with its velocity. We could also prescribe wall functions if it's a turbulent case to try and reduce the number of grid points within the domain that are required to resolve the boundary layer. This is a little bit gutsy in this case because the whole point of the case is to try and compare the solution to an analytical result, but it could also benchmark your wall function. You might also think of other strategies for boundary conditions for this type of case. What's very interesting about this case is just it's a closed volume. There's no inlets or outlets or far field conditions. It's simply two walls, and you can easily produce an infinite number of solutions by varying the boundary conditions for this case, if you have, of course, the right set of equations, like the Navier-Stokes equations in their unsteady form. Infinite number of solutions for the same types of boundary conditions. And all you have to do is change one number, and that's, of course, the velocity of the wall. The next case we'll look at is the flat plate case to study turbulent boundary layers or laminar boundary layers. We will be trying to look at these in our class with the computational approaches. Typically, the flat plates are very, very large, and you wouldn't model what's happening on the opposite side of the plate. In the lower part of the figure, we show one particular domain. Let's talk about the flow first. The flow enters from the left part of the domain and exits the right. There's an upper boundary where the flow might exit the domain, but generally the flow is predominantly from the left to right, and the velocity vector in the y direction is very, very, very small compared to the velocity vector in the x direction. The bottom part of the figure represents the wall. This little purple part between, say, negative 0.34 or 35 and 0 is typically represented as air. The leading edge of the plate is at x equals 0 and it extends to x equals infinity. Of course, we can have x equals infinity because we have discrete computers, so we'll just set it as x equals 2 for now. This is a rather small plate. Sometimes x might go to 100 or 50. You'll also notice the grid distribution is structured and it's a structured solver. You can see that mo there's many grid points that are located along the wall to completely resolve the boundary layer. There's also many grid points located near the leading edge of the plate to resolve the flow where it hits the leading edge of the plate and starts developing downstream. The grid is then stretched as you move downstream to save grid points. After all, there's not a lot of flow variation up here, so we don't need a lot of grid points. Near the wall, let's say x equals 1.5 or 2, we do. Now that we describe the flow and where it might leave and enter the domain and where the walls are and where it's entrained to exit the domain, we can talk about the boundary conditions or specifications. First of all, we would need to specify the velocity of the incoming flow or something about it or the pressure of that velocity or maybe the total pressure. Typically, for incompressible simulations, we might specify the so-called pressure inlet boundary condition or specify the velocity at the inlet, which is the red line. For the flow to leave the domain, we might specify a static pressure outlet. You might say, well, why can't I specify a mass flow inlet at, say, the red bar and at the exit domain specify a mass flow outlet? Well, unfortunately, some amount of the flow or fortunately for boundary layers, will leave the upper side of the domain. The problem is it's solution dependent and you don't know that in advance. 
All this region where my cursor is moving is essentially part of the free strain. We've truncated that off with this upper boundary, and so we cannot possibly do a mass flow balance. M dot is equal to M dot out. This is because we're not sure of how much mass flow is going across these two particular boundaries. So we would typically specify a pro static pressure outlet, maybe a, stat a velocity inlet or a total pressure inlet. And then you might ask, what do we do with this upper part of the domain? Well, I would recommend setting it as some sort of free stream or far field boundary condition and letting the flow to vary along it. And of course, it would have low disturbances because it's far away from the boundary layer, which is a requirement, and it would allow for the flow to be in train out of the boundary layer. Finally, we need to specify the wall. That would be the green part of the domain from x equals 0 to 2. We would specify this as a no-slip boundary because it corresponds to the wall, of course. Before that boundary, we would have a plane of symmetry from x equals uh, negative 0.5 to x equals 0 on y equals 0. That would, of course, we would specify as a symmetry condition or slip wall. You'll have the same effect. And this way, the flow will be able to come into the domain, be undisturbed, and not have the inlet boundary condition interrupted by the stagnation and zero velocity component as all its disturbances. The, if we do not put this slip wall region in, we might very much well corrupt our solutions. Let's next look at one of my favorite cases, which, which is the jet flow. We'll say we want a high speed jet flow, so it'll be compressible. Now, in the lower part of the figure, you see one particular solution, but it does show all the necessary boundaries. The flow enters a plenum of the nozzle, maybe from an engine or a large tank, and it goes through this contraction of the nozzle internal, so this is just the exterior view of the nozzle, and it goes through a converging diverging nozzle and it exits the nozzle here. Many people might naively put an inlet boundary condition at the exit of the nozzle. Unfortunately, we don't have boundary conditions that are generally um, robust enough to put boundary conditions here and resolve a fully turbulent off-design jet flow. The flow might enter or exit the domain on the outer parts of the boundary. You can see contours of the solution of the turbulent jet in the middle, where the flow moves from left to right, right out of the nozzle exit. At the interior of the nozzle would be a requirement for the inlet condition. Almost always for nozzle type flows or flows of this type and their um, friends, if you will, you would specify a stagnation pressure and stagnation temperature inlet condition. You would never specify a particular mass flow rate or particular velocity. And many students try this and of course the solution diverges. This is because the velocity needs to vary at the inlet condition based on the conditions in the nozzle and the flow development. So this means that if you want to have a particular mass flow rate or velocity coming through the nozzle the inlet or outlet, you'll have to back calculate it with analytical theory, maybe with the isentropic equations, or prescribe the value from an experimental measurement. In the end, it's often easiest to work with stagnation values. If you can have taken compressible flow, you'll see the power of these techniques. The flow exits the domain on the right. It's very typical to put a static pressure outlet condition. This assumes, though, that the flow is subsonic. If you replace that condition with, say, a Riemann invariant condition, you wouldn't have to worry about this at all, as the flow could be supersonic and subsonic. Finally, you around the exit, or excuse me, around the outer part of the domain, you would have to put maybe a free stream or far field condition. This will allow the jet to entrain the flow. For example, flow likely enters the left side of the domain outside of the nozzle and exits the domain on the upper right part. It's also entrained and enters domain in the upper left part of the flow. So you'll have to have a boundary condition which will allow inflow and outflow to happen seamlessly without any user invention. The only thing you would have to specify is the static pressure and the ambient Mach number. The ambient Mach number you might set to say 0.000001 if, for instance, the jet isn't moving relative to the ambient environment. You also set the static pressure to say the ambient pressure, which would be the same static pressure as the pressure outlet boundary condition on the right. If you don't make them equal, then you'll have unequal static pressures at this corner, the upper right corner, lower left corner of the domain. Mind you, this is three dimensions, so this actually is a circle which is wrapped around the exit of the domain. You might also ask yourself where are slip conditions beneficial? Recall the turbulent boundary layer case we just talked about. It could be that for the inlet condition within the nozzle, you would put a slip wall in front of the, the no slip wall within the nozzle. Oh, mind you, I forgot. Of course, the whole nozzle surface on the inside and outside and exit nozzle lip, you would put a no slip boundary condition. 
with appropriate heat transfer model. Because obviously, there'll be a lot of heating in this nozzle because it might be a high speed Mach 2 or 3 flow. Another really interesting case to examine is the direct numerical study of isotropic turbulence. We talked about DNS earlier in the class, and we'll talk a little bit more about it in numerics. But remember, direct numerical simulation is simply solving the unsteady Navier-Stokes equations directly without any turbulence modeling and resolving all scales of turbulence. These are the most expensive types of computational fluid dynamic simulations and of course are usually only run on the world's largest supercomputers for research type cases. On the right we see one type of particular solution from DNS. These little dashed lines here represent the outline of a cube. Within the cube we've plotted something that looks like vorticity tubes. These are really shown by isosurfaces, the so-called Q criterion. We'll talk about Q criterion later in the class on visualization. For now, just know this shown, a lot of turbulence vorticity is shown in the cube. How might we solve this with boundary conditions? Well, this is a case where initial conditions are very important. We would initialize the flow in the cube, and we would like to study the infinite domain in space of homogeneous isotropic turbulence. We can't do that within a computer, but we can like model it with periodic boundary conditions. So we've previously talked about the periodic boundary conditions. We would apply periodic boundary conditions on each face of the cube. Now in the x direction would be one pair of periodic boundary conditions corresponding to two sides of the cube. In the y and z directions would also be another pair of periodic boundary conditions. Remember, for every periodic boundary condition, it must have a sister who's the opposite pair. For example, if flow leaves the right side of the cube, it would re-enter the left side instantaneously. If flow exits the left side, it would re-enter the right side instantaneously. This is true for the top and bottom and front and back also. This allows for flow disturbances to go from one side to the other over an infinite distance and dissipate without any problems. Of course, you'll have to have the numerical methods for that. You can see that this is not a boundary condition or boundary value problem at all. It is absolutely and totally an initial condition problem to study the theory and numerics of turbulence. So you can see this problem is completely driven by the initial condition. And there is a whole theory of turbulence to understand, to, under, to, to set that initial condition. It can be actually much more difficult than appears. Another condition I want to talk about is the so-called rotorcraft example. Rotorcraft are some of the hardest cases to perform CFD for. On the left, we show one particular numerical simulation. This rotor is moving around counterclockwise. These are simulations and experiments done by NASA, and in particular the aeronautics part of NASA. Remember, aeronautics is a large part of NASA. On the left, you can see the red part of the blades are essentially um, on the surface, and you can see these tip vortices swirling around the blades. Below the blades are, of course, the wake vortices and turbulent wake of the vehicle. A similar experiment or corresponding experiment is shown in the upper right of only one set of the blades, the lower part. There's also an upper set of the blades to kind of study the co-rotating rotors you might see on some advanced helicopters. On the lower right, you see the hub and and, um, and blade. So this is basically one blade of three, which they would mirror around uh, by 120 degrees each in the plus or minus direction to find the full three-bladed rotor set. So what about boundary conditions for this external moving aerodynamics case? This is very difficult. First of all, you might imagine that we have to take care of the walls of the rotor. One idea is to set a no-slip condition on them and then rotate the grid. Once we have a rotating grid and no-slip boundary conditions, we would have to set the external boundaries. These might be just set as free stream boundary conditions with an inflow velocity um, that is initially set but can change. This way, the rotor, as it starts moving, it will change the velocities and pressures on the boundary seamlessly so that there's not a problem. There's a lot of vorticity going through the lower boundary. We might have to set that as a static pressure outlet to handle that and put it far away so that it doesn't disturb the flow. This is another major challenge. It could be that the flow is corrupted at some point in the solution time because the boundary becomes unstable numerically. Let's look at a more traditional external aerodynamics problem. We've shown this grid before. It's from NASA for the NASA Common Research Model. You can go to their webpage and download this geometry. We'll also try and look at this geometry in class.
In this case, we show the computational domain, where my cursor's moving is a plane of symmetry. Here's the fuselage of the aircraft with one particular engine mounted in front of the wing. You can notice it's simplified. There's certain elements of the aircraft which are missing. For example, the entire tail. Nonetheless, it's only designed to study CFD and the corresponding carefully constructed experiment. Remember, if you can't do this simple case with a very cleaned up geometry, it will be very difficult to do a full aircraft with many more complicated parts. Here's a cutaway of the wing on the lower right. You can see the grid is, of course, unstructured. There's a lot of grid points around the slat and flap and turbulent boundary layer to resolve them. This is an excellent grid. At the external part of the domain, we would set a free stream boundary condition. We would only specify the static pressure, which might correspond to the altitude static pressure of the atmosphere, and the Mach number of the aircraft. We would also specify angles, alpha and beta. Of course, alpha is for the pitch of the aircraft and beta is for the yaw. Here, beta would be zero because we have a plane of symmetry. If we wanted beta non-zero, then we would have to remove the plane of symmetry and perform the CFD on the entire aerodynamic body. Down the middle of the aircraft, we've taken advantage of the plane of symmetry, and we use a symmetric boundary condition. That is, the flow will be mirrored on the left and right. By making this assumption, we also have to imply, it is implied that the solver will be a steady flow solver. We can also simulate the effects of the engine. Here, the airflow might enter the engine and exit. We can prescribe boundary conditions that would correspond to a pressure-based inlet, which is the inlet excuse me, a pressure-based outlet of the CFD, which represent a inlet of the engine, the fan phase. And for the nozzle or exit or exhaust flow of the engine, we would specify, for example, a stagnation pressure and temperature inlet to the CFD domain, which would correspond to the outlet of the engine system. So we would not model of CFD for this particular case, the entire internal aerodynamics and combustion and heat transfer and all these other things, the actual engine itself, along with all the other complicated components, we would actually model only the inlet and outlet conditions of the engine itself. This is typically what's done in full scale commercial aviation problems. You can also study the engine itself we might show some examples of that later. Let's talk about some best practices of boundary conditions. Remember, many times, as we'll see in the future for in our numerical section, that the solutions diverge, that is, they're failing, and the air is blowing up. I've shown one example of divergence on the right. On the x-axis is the iteration of the solver, that is, the solver is advancing towards the solution of each iteration. The y-axis is something like residual. At the first initial condition of the solver, the residual is something like 0.01. Notice this is a log scale. As we increase iterations, the iteration is blown up and the solvers become stable. This is not ideal, and we may not have found a true solution, and we might call this a divergent case. In a true divergent case, the residual, that is the air of the solution, blows up and goes to infinity, and the whole solver, that is the computer program solving the equations in motion, that we worked so hard to set up, fails and crashes. And of course, it's just like a computer program crashing on your computer, except it might have already eaten up thousands and thousands of your computational hours. Why might this happen? Well, sometimes it happens because the computational grid has poor statistics and is poorly designed. A more likely case that the solver is robust and that the flow diverges is that the boundary conditions were improperly set. Or if they're properly set, perhaps some specification like static pressure or stagnation pressure are values which give or provide a flow which has no solution or give some unphysical solution. Or perhaps where two boundaries meet, we have specified something that's impossible. For example, it could be possible to place the outlet static pressure condition with the free stream pressure condition with a Mach number that does not correspond to any physical solution where the two boundaries meet. Likewise, you might have specified a velocity at a wall for an inlet condition that is next to a no-slip wall. This is another major problem because you're asking for two things to happen at one location within the CFD solver. It's just not physically possible according to the equations of motion. This is troubling, and only with experience and understanding the assumptions and specify of the boundary conditions can you avoid these very common er issues and errors for new users. You will probably make them, and that's okay. It's just good to be aware of how to diagnose and look at your cases and try and find these problems.
For new users, it's often done through a little bit of trial and error and asking users who may be in more experience. So don't be afraid to ask fellow students or other people for you know, help with your questions. There's other particular simple working examples. You might have cases with walls only. Well, there has to be something to drive the flow. Maybe it's one wall is moving. Maybe one wall has a different temperature than other walls. These would be valid cases, especially for study and study flows. Another case might be a wall in the inlet and at least only one constant boundary pressure. This would also cause an error. Walls and constant pressure boundaries might also be a problem. There would be nothing to drive the flow. For example, in a pipe, you might specify two pressures at the inlet and outlet. If both pressures are the same, there would be no pressure gradient in the flow and nothing would happen with the solver. It might just crash or give you a solution which shows that the flow is zero everywhere, which of course would be successful because it's a trivial solution and it's giving you a solution for what you specified. Let's talk about best practices for outlets. The the best outlet is prescribed as far downstream from the flow disturbances as possible. We'll show an example of this in a second. Outlet boundary conditions, which prescribe the velocity or mass flow rate, can only be used if an inlet boundary condition is present. Now there is a caveat to this. If you have a large plenum and you have an outlet and you want to study how the flow moves out of the plenum, you would simply only have one outlet. But this is more of a pressure vessel case and is a rare case in CFD. It is usually preferable to use constant pressure for outlets. You can also specify, remember, mass flow outlets and velocity outlets, but these are numerically stiff. That is, they produce problems which are not as well posed for the solver to, to move forward through. The static pressure outlet for subsonic flows is probably one of the mo re most robust outlets. You can also, of course, specify supersonic outlets and they'll always be extrapolation using extrapolation from the interior of the domain. Why? Because remember, flow only moves out of the domain supersonically, and then information only travels in one direction. One of the most important pieces of advice I have for boundary condition placement, and not specification, is to locate them as far away from the disturbances as you can, even internal flow. For example, let's look at the figure on the lower part of the screen. Here, flow moves from left to right, the top and bottom part of the boundaries are walls, here and here. On the left, we have an inflow boundary condition. On the right, we have an outflow boundary condition. Let's not worry too much about their particular specification. Within the interior of this flow, we have put two little blocks of height and width h. The flow enters from the left and it separates at the end of these blocks and it creates a little recirculation region. This is completely physical and what happens in reality. Now, let's say we want to try and capture and, re and study this recirculation region. Where should we put the outlet boundary condition? Now, we have some choices on where to put the outlet boundary condition. For example, we could extend the walls very much past the two blocks and put it very far downstream. At first, you might say, well, I want to have the smallest domain as possible to save computational um, uh, cost. So I might put my outlet boundary condition at this dashed line. You can imagine putting your hand over the two rest of the figure on the right, and our computational domain will only be here. But of course, we would specify an outlet condition where there's recirculation happening. This, you might still find a solution, but it would be totally unphysical. So you would have trouble saying, if I have a solution which is converged and satisfies my equations, why would it be wrong? Well, it's wrong because we've placed a boundary condition where it's physically unrealistic and the boundary condition does not specify or, or allow the solver to find the corresponding recirculation region behind the blocks. That's very troubling. So you don't typically want to place boundaries too close in a wake region or regions of high circulation or turbulence. What is the fix? The fix is to add in more wall downstream of where the flow phenomena is in this case. In this case it's a wake and circulation. The flow reattaches to the wall downstream. Let's say we put our boundary condition here. This boundary condition would have a flow which is still developing and maybe not the best for going out the outlet. It would result in a solution of poor accuracy. It would still correspond qualitatively to the actual solution, that is the one found in an experiment perhaps, but it's still not the best place. Ideally, we would put the boundary condition down even farther. For example, at a distance of say L greater than at least 10 H, 
So if H is the largest length scale of, say, our aerodynamic body, we would want to put the outflow boundary condition many length scales downstream. In this case, they put a minimum of 10. If we put our outlet boundary condition here and it just extend the walls fictitiously much farther downstream and put enough grid points to resolve the flow and let it fully develop and dissipate near before it gets to the outlet, we'll have a much better solution. With my students in my research group, I typically tell them to place for like a jet case, the exit boundary or outlet boundary conditions at least 100 length scales downstream. I do this for research purposes. Many people, like in this case, who are just studying fluid dynamics itself, might only do 10 or 20, or maybe 50 would be even better. Ideally, the farther out the boundary is, the better. Of course, there's an unrealistic distances. For example, 1,000 or 10,000 length scales downstream wouldn't be a good choice. It would also be a good idea to put the inlet of the domain farther upstream. That is, we would extend these walls upstream with, say, um, slip boundary condition walls and put the outlet far to the left on the screen. Perhaps also at least 10 length scales upstream. That would be 10H in this case. What's the bottom line? Place your outlets and other boundaries like far field, Riemann invariant, inlets and outlets far upstream and downstream as possible so that you do not disturb and truncate the flow near the region of interest. Regions of circulations will be completely ruined if a simulation has a boundary condition near them. This is also true for jets, shear layers, boundary layers, and any other type of flow phenomena that you can think of. This is a universal rule of thumb, but usually you learn it the hard way. Your solutions might look totally normal, visually at least from like a poor accuracy condition, which is only maybe at 10H. At minimum, place the outlet boundary condition at least 10 integral length scales downstream from your aerodynamic bodies. Let's talk a little bit about best practices for the turbulent boundary layers. Here in the bottom, we've shown one sketch. A flow comes in at a uniform velocity and hits the plate. Notice the boundary condition of the slip wall is removed here, because it's just showing the problem, not necessarily the computational one. The flow comes in in its laminar initially, and then goes through a transitional region from a laminar to a turbulent flow, and it becomes fully turbulent downstream. The turbulent boundary layer, which is delta, changes as you move downstream and it increases. You also need to have enough grid points within the boundary layer to resolve the viscous sublayer, the buffer layer, and the overlap layer, and the fully turbulent outer regime, and of course the flow outside the turbulence, which is relevant. Now, as we discussed earlier in the structured grid problem, we have alluded to the fact that we must resolve the boundary layer. Typically, we do not know in advance if we have resolved it or not. We would perform what we call a grid independent study. We've talked about this before. We would take one solution, which is converged, and double the number of grid points in all directions. In three dimensions, this would essentially be multiplying it by two to the third. We would increase our number of grid points by eight if it's a structured grid and we add grid points in all three directions between every other grid point. This is very expensive. Then we rerun the code. Now, we would have two solutions, one on the original grid and one on the refined grid. If they are the same, then we have at least a rudimentary grid independent study. This is good, but very expensive and necessary. Once we do that, we could look within our boundary layer, and we would have to also ensure that the so-called distance from the wall to the first grid point, that is the first y plus value, is at least between one and five for turbulent flows. This is something we'll discuss later in the turbulence modeling section. Now this is very expensive and I mentioned before we might use wall functions. Computationally, wall functions will be much cheaper than the turbulent case, but there's no wall function in existence that I'm aware of that effectively and will solve for general cases the transition from laminar flow to, to transitional to turbulent flow. If we do, thankfully, we would have y plus distances of about 11 or 12, which of course is good because it saves computational resources. This becomes even more complicated for very complicated and realistic turbulent flows. We'll talk more about this later. For this particular problem, we could actually specify a no slip wall condition in the region x over CR and specify a transition boundary condition in the transition range, and then finally specify maybe a wall condition in the fully turbulent range. 
The difficulty, of course, now is knowing where to specify the boundary conditions in advance. You'll have to have an experiment to guide you. This is a case where experimental data is essential for CFD. Let's look at boundary condition best practices for the symmetry and axisymmetric condition. And we'll do that through a simple example. Look in the lower part of the figure. We have basically a tube with flow in it with one particular hole in it. There's Typically, without the hole, we could use the axisymmetric boundary condition and do the whole problem in two dimensions. We would be forced to do the problem in three dimensions if there's a hole in the side of the toe, tube where perhaps there's an inflow. We'd use a single plane of symmetry down the middle of the tube. This is wonderful and would save computational expense either way. One, it would be a three-dimensional and two-dimensional case, and one would be a three-dimensional to half the original three-dimensional case for the symmetric condition. If you're selecting axisymmetric or symmetric planes, you'll have to make very careful choices and the implications on the solution. Remember, if the flow is symmetric or axisymmetric, it can be mirrored around those particular planes or lines respectively. For nozzle flows that are cylindrical or rectangular, you can obviously find axisymmetric conditions or symmetry planes respectively. Just know that you're limiting the scales of turbulence which can exist in that flow if you're running an unsteady case. In fact, a two-dimensional axisymmetric grid for a nozzle will never be able to fully resolve fully dimensional turbulence. You can also apply this for two-dimensional and three-dimensional turbulent cascades. In turbulent cascades or fans of engines, for example, you can easily find planes of symmetry where you might be able to apply the periodic boundary condition. That's very important to apply a periodic boundary condition instead of a symmetric boundary condition. You can probably think of hundreds of other examples of planes of symmetry of flows you want to study. There are many flows where there are no planes of symmetry. For example, the lungs or the human heart are two obvious examples. Typically in biological flows, we will not find many planes of symmetry. Let's talk about what we discussed in this part of the module. We have shown some classic CFD cases and associated boundary conditions. In particular, we talked about just rudimentary best practices for their placement. This is enough to get you started and learning CFD. We've shown a few examples, simulations, and associated boundary conditions. Remember, boundary conditions are developed from partial differential equations and for CFD are very difficult to formulate, specialized in the discrete framework, but they always correspond to some boundary condition which is developed in the continuum framework. They are placed so as not to interfere with the solution. Remember to place them far away from your particular solution. Some boundary conditions are fictitious. They do not really exist in reality. They are, for example, the far field condition, the free stream condition, and inlets and outlets. There's truly no inlet or outlet in a fluid domain. They are just where we cut the fluid for the solution. After all, it usually has to come from somewhere. There's probably a few cases where there truly is a realistic inlet and outlet, but they're pretty rare in the practice of CFD and aerospace engineering. Only with experience can you effectively choose their placement, use, and development. So over time, with just playing around with codes and having a little bit of fun, you'll get a really good feeling for their use. It's the only way to truly learn it. But you have a really great place now to get started. Next time, we'll be transitioning to numerics. This will be, once again, the transforming of governing equations, which will be a short review for you now from our earlier class. And we'll look at numerics of finite differencing, the motivation of finite differencing, basic finite differences, and we'll talk about new things such as the mixed finite difference and higher order of accuracy schemes for the traditional finite difference. A specialized kind of finite differencing, if you will, might be called the so-called spectral or pseudo-spectral methods. We'll talk about those too. It'll be a lot of fun and you'll start to develop and get insight into how solvers are run or even be able to write your own if you so desire. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm your professor, Steve Miller.